In this lecture, we're going to break down the SN1E1 uh, reaction and show how it relates to the solvolysis reaction that we looked at yesterday. And so um, getting into it, I believe this is 95. Okay, so um, what I wanna do is just continue to emphasize how uh, sort of unexpected this reaction is. That is, if we mix these two molecules together, where this is a, a good nucleophile, it's negatively charged, right? Um, a typical nucleophile that we've used in the past for SN2 reactions, but we have a tertiary haloalkane, which is not a good substrate for an SN2 reaction. We won't see an SN2 reaction. We will see no reaction that is to say that only the starting materials are observed when we do our analysis. So instead, what we notice is that if we want to get this reaction to work, we have to make one small change. We replace the, keep the substrate the same, but we replace the nucleophile with, instead of having a negative charge or um, countered by a sodium or potassium or lithium counter ion, we just add an acid to the material and get back um, really just the, the alcohol that we used to make the original nucleophile. So that alcohol is both the nucleophile and the solvent. So if we used acetone or something in the SN2 reaction process, a typical polar aprotic solvent, we would actually have to use a polar protic solvent. Um, and that polar protic solvent is going to be a combination with um, I just reached for a bug. Okay, anyway, sorry. Um, the polar uh, protic solvent is actually going to be used as our nucleophile. And if we mix these things together, we get what looks like our substitution product or the substitution product that we hope to have gotten from the SN2 reaction. Now, additionally, we're going to see another product, which is our elimination product. Now, I said before this was a solvolysis reaction, but it's also an example of the new reaction we want to look at, which is an SN1E1 reaction. So I put SN1 and then slash E1. So there, these are actually two reactions that happen simultaneously with each other. So the SN1 reaction, of course, happens to give our substitution product and the E1 reaction happens to give our elimination product. Okay. So if you'll notice, the letters SN1 and the letters E1 look a lot like the letters that we used for the SN2 and the E2 reaction. So the only thing that's different is the number one. So one is used in either case because this is no longer a bimolecular reaction. Because instead of this being a bimolecular reaction, which it no longer, it is not. The SN2 reaction and the E2 reactions are examples of bimolecular reactions. This is a unimolecular reaction. I'm gonna write that and then we wanna think about what it means to be bimolecular. Well, in the bimolecular reaction for the SN2 and the E2 reaction, we had two concentrations, our nucleophile and our electrophile in the rate law for the reaction. Now that's different than what we're going to see for the SN1 and the E1 reaction. So the rate for, um, and let's call this, let's just go ahead and label this rate law for the SN1 is going to be rate is equal to a rate constant times the concentration of our haloalkane times now before we had the nucleophile, but that's not going to be used in this case. So I'm gonna make that nice and thick. So we definitely don't want our nucleophile. That is to say that if you look at this, we actually have only one concentration in the rate law. If we have only one concentration in the rate law, we say that by definition, definition is a unimolecular reaction. 
Now the right law for the E1 reaction is actually identical. Its rate is equal to rate constant times the concentration of a reactant. And it is the, react the uh, reactant, the haloalkane. And so we put brackets around it to indicate concentrations, but that's it. There's no base that's being included here. It's simply the haloalkane. And there too, shows that if we have only one concentration, we're going to have another unimolecular reaction. Okay, so these are the two rate laws for the SN1 and the E1 reaction. This is uh, going to show us where the number one comes from as we describe these reactions, the SN1 and the E1 reaction. What I want to get to now is I want to go ahead and try to show you the mechanism for this reaction. So really the mechanism is helpful here because we want to know what's going on. This should all be unexpected and a little bit, um, you know, confounding, whatever. It, this, is, this shouldn't be working well with what you understand about organic chemistry. We made a big deal about how in the last, in the last lecture or a lecture ago or something, we made a big deal about steric hindrance being a big deal in the SN2 reaction. That is, it really slows down the SN2 reaction. And so any reaction of a haloalkane should be seemingly slowed down by having more steric hindrance. But here we're saying that it's the tertiary haloalkane and we're adding to this, and I'll just pick on methanol here, tertiary haloalkane, this is a poor electrophile. And then we have, um, because of sterics, there's just a lot of stuff around the haloalkane carbon. In addition, we're adding this to methanol. We're getting an SN1 and E1 reaction that works, okay? Now, the thing about methanol is it's a poor nucleophile. That is to say there's no charge. And it's actually a fairly electronegative atom. If you recall, we said the things that make for a good nucleophile are those that have atoms that have a negative charge in them and atoms that are less nucleophilic. So like a negatively charged oxygen is okay, but a negatively charged nitrogen is better or a negatively charged sulfur is better. Both of those are less electronegative. Now, similarly, that negative charge is kind of critical for serving as a good nucleophile. There are ways to use neutral nucleophiles, but they're usually less electronegative, like phosphorus, for example. So the fact that we have a neutral, highly electronegative element suggests that we should have a poor nucleophile. And indeed we do. It's the combination of a sterically hindered haloalkane, which is not good for an SN2 reaction, and the combination of a poor nucleophile that make for a reaction that works. These are two things that work strongly against an SN2 reaction. But so why are they working for the SN1 reaction? Well, the perspective to have is that, first of all, use of the poor nucleophile and steric, uh, sterically, steric hindered haloalkane shut down SN2 and E2 processes. We don't have we have too much steric hindrance around the haloalkane and too poor of a nucleophile to see backside attack, conversion of configuration, and all of that stuff. Similarly, we don't have an E2 base. So we're not gonna see an SN2 reaction and an E2 reaction. This allows for other reactions to occur. Okay. And these other reactions are going to be the SN1 and the E1. So why does the, why do the SN1 slash E1 reactions work when SN2 and E2 cannot? The big reason is that the hindered, and I want to 
I want to hindered is an important word, especially when you're thinking about how fast or easily an SN2 reaction can occur. But hindered is not what I want us to think about right now. I want us to think instead about substituted haloalkanes can form car, and I'm going to write this in all caps, and I'm going to write this clear because this is critically important for understanding this reaction. Carbocations. Okay. So honestly, every time you want to think about a halo or a, um, an SN1 or an E1 reaction, you should immediately think about carbocations. Now here's what happens. The first step in both SN1 slash E1 reactions is carbocation formation. Okay, so let's show that and we'll pick on our example here. Now, to get to a carbocation, what we're doing is we are allowing the bromine to walk away in a heterolysis reaction before the bromine or the leaving group was, was being pushed off by the nucleophile. So the bromine or the leaving group spontaneously um, leaves in a heterolysis reaction. It's the exact same arrow that we used in the SN2 reaction, but we don't, we're not getting pushed off by a nucleophile. So the bromine is just walking away. And whenever we have a heterolysis reaction, the thing that receives the electrons decreases its charge by one, whereas the thing that lost the electrons increases its charge by one. And so what I wanna point out here is we have this cation that is centered at a carbon element. That is our carbocation. So when the leaving group spontaneously leaves, that's given that gives us a C plus, which is a carbocation. So a cation is a positively charged thing. A carbocation is a positive charge that's centered on the element carbon. And so this happens in both the SN1 and the E1 reactions. So if I asked you to provide a mechanism for an SN1 E1 reaction, the first thing you think about is that we're going to see a carbocation intermediate. So the first thing that you need to do is draw the halogen or the leaving group leaving to form the carbocation intermediate. Now, why do carbocations form? Well, to answer that, what we want to look at is carbocation stability. So carbocations, and really any cation or electron deficient center, are stabilized by additional substituents. And this, um, this observation or phenomena is called hyperconjugation. Now that's a term and an effect that is difficult to understand until you see what non-hyperconjugation is or just conjugation in general, which we're going to look at a lot more in organic chemistry too. So when you see conjugation, and then, when, then you can kind of understand where we're coming from with the added term hyper in front of this. But suffice it to say, more substitution leads to more stable carbocations. And what we can actually do is, and this is the same for um, radicals as well. What I'm going to show you is an effect that we've actually looked at before with radicals. And that is if you have, 
a positive charge on a CH3, this is called a methyl cation. Now, the methyl cation is so unstable that any attempts to observe it are highly controversial. In fact, we could say that it's so unstable, it's ever unlikely to be formed. And it's far less stable than the corresponding. Actually, I'm going to draw it this way, uh, just so we're clear. You don't draw bonds to positive charges. They just sit on certain atoms. Okay, so now I have an R group extending to a CH2 with a positive charge. I don't want to add dots, but I'm going to point to the cation, the carbo cation center. Now what we would say is that in this case, we have one substituent at that carbocation center, two hydrogens, but then one of uh, one, one place has a substituent, an R group, which could be anything we want. So if we have one substituent on our carbocation center, that is a primary or one degree carbocation. So this is primary. And that's much less stable than if we have two substituents on the carbon bearing the positive charge. This is a secondary carbocation. Okay, now it turns out, it's kind of interesting, is if we compare the methyl versus the primary, and methyl is so unstable, it's really not ever productively observed or practically observed. Primary is in a similar boat. It's actually fairly unstable to form primary carbocations unless you have very specialized substituents present, um, single substituent present. Then similarly, so they're in, in most cases far less stable than secondary, which is less stable than tertiary. So in a tertiary carbocation, what we see is that the carbon bearing the positive charge has not one, but three substituents present and zero hydrogens. So this is tertiary, and this is our most substituted. And if it's the most substituted, it's also the most stable. Okay. So knowing these trends is important. Knowing what a methyl cation versus a primary versus a secondary versus a tertiary carbocation, knowing what those things are is important. And this builds off of the same skills that we've used to identify methyl primary, secondary, and tertiary haloalkanes and radicals. And we'll use them again to, in the future to identify primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols and amines and amides and so, the skill set's important. You need to know what primary, secondary, tertiary, and then what methyl are. Now, with this in mind, we can start to understand an answer to the initial question, which was, why do carbocations form? So I'm just going to rewrite this question at the top of the next page. So why do carbocations form? They form when they can be stabilized. And what I'm getting at is if you take a tertiary halo alkane in an equilibrium process that in most cases may favor the starting materials in many cases, but the equilibrium isn't as bad. And what you'll see is a decent concentration where you have the leaving group simply leaving to form a ter tertiary haloalkane. Now maybe the X minus that forms after that heterolysis reaction wants to jump back on and that's just an equilibrium process. But if we have some equilibrium concentration, some amount of this carbocation intermediate, we can actually, um, we can actually do other reactions. This carbocation in 
intermediate can do SN1 and E1 reactions to give substitution and elimination products. Okay, so these two new reactions, the, the SN1 and the E1 reaction result from the same intermediate. So whenever you form that intermediate, that carbocation intermediate, you can get SN1 and E1 products, which is why I always draw these reactions together, SN1 slash E1, because whenever possible, you will do them both together. So the SN1 and E1 reactions um, uh, go through or proceed through the same intermediate. and happen at the same time. The intermediate is the carbocation. And happen, I'm not gonna say at the same time. They happen together. So whenever possible, you don't do SN1 by itself, you do SN1 and E1 together. So that's why I write SN1, E1 together. Now, what we can do is in the following page, I'll probably just start a new page. Um, we can, uh, let's look at the mechanism for both of these. Okay, so what I wanna do is for the mechanism, I'm going to change the conditions slightly. I'm gonna use the exact same haloalkane, tilt my camera down, keep going off screen. I wanna use the exact same haloalkane, but um, I'm going to use some sort of nucleophile, okay? I don't have a good enough substrate to do an SN2 reaction. So this is going to have to go through an SN1 reaction. And the SN1 reaction, SN1 E1 reaction is going to provide two products. One of which is going to be a product of substitution where you replace or you substitute the bromine for a nucleophile plus this other product, which is our E1 product, elimination. Now let's look at both of these. So it actually makes learning this a little bit easier if we replace the methanol or ethanol solvent in a solvolysis reaction with some generic nucleophile. Okay, so what's the mechanism for this? And the mechanism is, is again sort of the story of the reaction where we see the curly arrows start to work together to show how the intermediates are formed and then what the intermediates ultimately do to give rise to the products. The first step in the mechanism is, well, if I say provide or do anything with an SN1E1 reaction, you must immediately think carbocation. That needs to be a sort of reflex. When you hear SN1E1 think, okay, carbocation's involved because it is. If it's not involved, then we're doing a different reaction altogether. So the first step is formation of the carbocation, which is going to be where the bromine walks away in a heterolysis reaction. That's going to give rise to the carbocation that can do SN1 and E1 reactions. Note, I redrew this to be trigonal planar. That's something that I prefer to do because now that carbon in the center is sp2. It only has three things attached to it. It doesn't have, I know there's a positive charge, but that's not a fourth thing. That's actually a hole or an emptiness in the molecule. So it's trigonal planar at the carbon that's labeled with a positive charge and this carbocation intermediate, which we could highlight if we still want to correspond, is going to do each of the SN1 and the S and the E1 reactions. Okay. So for the SN1 reaction, what we're going to see is that the positive charge at the carbocation center is going to engage the nucleophile. So it's a combination of a minus with a plus. Now the minus always does the attacking. It has the thing. It has the lone pair of electrons that we can actually draw that arrow from if we wanted to. They give rise to that negative formal charge that are attracted to the positive charge of our carbocation intermediate. That's going to give rise to this structure up here. 
Now, the arrows make sense. We've combined negative plus positive. We have an overall neutral set of, uh, overall our charge is neutral on the left and neutral on the right as we, as we just kind of interact and form the new covalent bond. So we have a new bond here. And that's how we do the substitution. The thing I forgot above was I should have added a Br minus just to balance the equation so that you can see that we're neutral on the left and overall neutral on the right for the first step in our reaction. Okay, now what we can do is the E1 reaction. Now the E1 reaction, just like the E2 reaction is going to involve loss of a vicinal hydrogen to form an alkene. So it's a very similar process to the E2 reaction, except that we're not using a base to deprotonate or remove that vicinal hydrogen. We're going to allow that vicinal hydrogen to simply walk away. Now, does it simply walk away? No, it's usually plucked off by solvent molecules, maybe even perhaps the Br minus. It's, um, it's hard to know for certain um, to, <clears throat> because we don't have all of the reaction conditions, but, and it could be even picked off by the nucleophile in some cases. Anyway, there are things around that can allow the hydrogen to be removed. And so what's going to happen is we're going to see a heterolysis reaction where the electrons between the carbon hydrogen bond move down. And in this case, instead of forming a negative charge on the carbon atom, the thing that receives the electrons, we're going to make a new bond, a carbon-carbon double bond. That's going to give rise to this intermediate, where now we have a new CC double bond resulting from loss of the H+. Now the H+, plus will probably be picked up um, or bonded to solvent nuke minus or Br minus. It just sort of depends on the reaction conditions. It doesn't necessarily fall off unprovoked like in the gas phase or something, but it can fall off and be consumed by something else that's in the reaction mixture. And that just gives rise to our elimination or our E1 product. So both of these, if you wanted to propose the product for the reaction, you would have to include both of these. And if you wanted to propose a mechanism, you should also um, include both of these. Now, what I want to do to just close out this lecture is to consider the energy diagrams for the SN1 E1 reactions. Now, some things to know. An intermediate is involved. And that's our carbocation. And this is a unimolecular reaction. And as a result, there is one concentration in the rate determining step one concentration in the rate determining step, and that is the um, halo alkane. That's the only concentration in the rate determining step because that's the only concentration in the rate law. Okay, now with that in mind, what we have is a reaction that looks like this. Now, most of the reactions that we look at will be exergonic. And so we will start with a higher energy starting material than product. Now, additionally, intermediates that form, particularly charged intermediates that are often neutralized, will be higher in energy. So we will have an intermediate right here. So this intermediate is our carbocation. So with an intermediate now, we're going to introduce an additional transition state. Instead of just having one transition state between the starting material and the product, we're going to have two 
Okay, so we're going to have two transition states. Now, the thing to note is that there's only one um, there's only one uh, reactant concentration at the rate determining step because there's only one reactant concentration, the haloalkane, in the um, rate law. Okay, so the rate does not at all depend on the concentration of the nucleophile um, for this re for either of these reactions. And I guess there's not a nucleophile technically for the E1 reaction. So what that means is that the first transition state is actually going to be higher in energy than the second transition state, because the second transition state involves a nucleophile and probably some weak base to remove that proton. Again, I don't know what it is, a solvent usually, probably. So this second step uses nucleophile or a base. And so with this in mind, now our energy diagram becomes, I guess I had my transition state drawn a little awkwardly, becomes this, where transition state one defines the rate determining step. So this applies to both, and I should add some axes here, reaction coordinate, but this applies to both the SN1 and the E1 reaction. Okay, it's higher in energy to form that carbocation intermediate and it's a slower step. After the carbocation intermediate is formed through that slower step to give a high energy intermediate, it rapidly through a lower energy transition state reacts by way of an E1 or an SN1 process. Now that second transition state is going to be different for each process. So let's take some notes on this. Number one, the most important thing to note is that formation of the carbocation is rate determining. Secondly, the transition state, and so let me just let me just finish that point. That means that TS1 will be higher in energy than TS2. Because if TS2 is higher in energy, that means that we have to invoke the nucleophile or base in the rate law. And that's not consistent with our experimental results. Number two, I just want to point out this applies to both SN1 and E1 reactions, but TS2 is different for SN1 and E1. And that should make sense. The second transition state is going to give rise to the final product in these, and both the SN1 and the E1 reactions form different products. And so there's just going to be different transition state energy for each of those processes. And in fact, if you looked at the relative heights of the transition state two for the SN1 and the transition state two for the E1 reactions, you will see um, that that height will correlate to the difference in the various amounts of each product that form. That is, if you get a different amount of SN1 substitution and elimination E1 products that form, it usually correlates to a difference in either concentration of the nucleophile or the relative transition state energy for the um, final product. But anyway, um, so that will uh, do it for this lecture. So this was a pretty um, big overview of the SN1 E1 reaction in the next few lectures. We'll look deeper into some important aspects of it, starting with the mechanism for the solvolysis substitution reaction, and then we'll go into practicing um, various uh, examples of these.